Okay, welcome. Um, I'm Dave Thanoon. I'm director of the NYU Center on U.S.-China Relations, and we're delighted to have you here tonight. Uh, we're also extremely pleased to have Dr. Fang Gang with us. Uh, he's someone of really exceptional ability. Uh, those of you who know Beijing well know that he's one of the very top economic advisors to the Chinese government. Uh, and what you'll find uh, as he talks and as he answers your questions is that not only does he have the technical skill to deal with complex economic issues, but he has the political skill uh, to explain um, what the trade-offs are that the Chinese government is dealing with and what the um, uh, choices are uh, that are constrained by politics. Uh, and he's an extraordinarily candid person. We were very fortunate that Dr. Fan uh, came two days ago. We had a welcome dinner, and he gave us a preview of some of the things he's going to say tonight. Uh, but I think what's interesting is that most economists uh, do not understand politics, and most political scientists don't understand economics. Um, some of you know that I have combined the two fields, and I was delighted to find how skillful he is at combining this. Uh, and I think you'll uh, enjoy the range and breadth of his background. Uh, let me say also that when he answers questions, you're going to get a sense for um, the complexity of the choices that the Chinese government now faces. We had 30 years of exceptionally rapid growth. The question is now how to extend that and what the choices are. And I think you'll see how he explores that. Um, if you look on the programs that all you have on the back, he has uh, a detailed bio there, so I'm not going to go through that. But I'll just say that he is a professor at Peking University uh, and uh, also director of the National Economic Research Institute. So uh, two very prominent institutions, uh, and he's a key figure in those as an academic. Uh, but his influence in China comes from people's uh, interest in getting his opinion, uh, as we'll be getting tonight. This is the first lecture in our public lecture series for the center. Uh, and we're delighted to have Dr. Fan with us. Um, I will say that uh, you will get a sense for his abilities, and you'll understand why, in addition to what he's done in China, that he's been asked to be a consultant uh, to the Asian Development Bank in Manila, uh, to the World Bank in Washington, uh, and to the OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, in Paris. So he's somebody who's exceptionally broad-ranging, uh, and very skilled. Uh, can we all welcome Dr. Fon here? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Dinong, and thank you all to come to this uh, seminar. I think uh, I will use about probably uh, 30 minutes to go through uh, my slides on two issues. Uh, I will go first on the uh, uh, short-term issue, what's going on in China, what about the Chinese economy at the moment, a lot of talk about it. collapse, uh, hard landing, uh, 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 you know, uh, financial crisis. I'll go through uh, uh, the basic questions of what's, what's, what's really going on. And then, of course, we go to the long-term issue. Uh, how would be the next stage of the China's development? And if we're on the development, we've got to have reforms. So how are the reforms going on? And what the, we can expect that uh, uh, what, what's going to happen? Well, first of all, what, what's going on with the Chinese economy? Well, basically, I will be very quick. I will be, we will uh, leave more uh, time for the Q&A. Uh, in short, uh, what's going on in the Chinese economy, we're dealing with the uh, aftermath of two overheating in the past 10 years. Uh, two overheating was uh, from 2004 to 2007, which uh, is a domestic uh, 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 overheating plus the background of US, uh, the global overheating uh, financial uh, bubbles before the financial crisis. Then the Chinese government, the, 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 uh, have adopted policies to deal with overheating. So in the 2008, there's an adjustment. Uh, uh, there is a slowdown and adjustment, uh, but maybe the adjustment didn't uh, finish uh, the war 
financial crisis happened. Then the Chinese government adopted the, the stimulus policy, which uh, created another overheating between 2009 and 2010. So this is the, the short-term fluctuations of the economy. With these two overheatings, you can expect a lot of that things would happen, will be left over from those overheatings, overcapacity, debt problems, uh, the uh, uh, bubbles in the in the real estate housing sectors. So now is those issues are uh, uh, currently issues are uh, the economy still uh, deal with. It's a soft landing. It's a soft landing because uh, the government policies did play some roles to prevent the bubble goes too far. Particularly in the second overheating, the government changed the policy quite quickly. Those stimulus policy mainly only uh, uh, actually played a role for one year between 2009 and to the early 2010. So now we have the word exit, right? Uh, people talk about the when the U.S. will exit the uh, uh, quantity easing policies. If in that term, China was the first one to exit this uh, stimulus policy in 2010. So that's why uh, there's a bubbles, for example, in the, in the housing market. There's a bubbles, but the bubble didn't spread over to the second tier, third tier, and the first tier cities. So by average of the national market, the, the bubble was not really very big. Without a big bubble, you don't need a, you don't need a hard landing. The soft landing is impossible. After four years of this kind of the uh, management, uh, the economy is stabilizing. Of course, it's still deal with that uh, problems, but it's still uh, stabilized. Uh, I'm not going to that details, uh, but uh, it's a basic situation. Uh, there's no. Uh, hard landing to happen uh, uh, because soft landing is uh, mostly achieved. Recently, government, only last week actually, the central bank relaxed the, the, the policy regarding the, uh, 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 the housing market, right? Uh, this actually can remind a lot of people who we talk about the hard landing. Current situation of the market is still under very restrictive government policies. Like the housing market, the policy was actually uh, forbidden you purchase the house. If you already have the first house, you are not, for, you are not allowed to buy the second house with a very restrictive and administrative uh, policies. Without the relaxation of those policies, the, the hard banking things can be can be avoided. So that's all the, uh, all the, uh, uh, the argument for the soft learning. Anyway, uh, that's the current uh, situation. It, it's uh, still going on. A lot of issues still need to address out. For example, the local government debt. Now we have the re, 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 uh, 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 change the law for the uh, budgetary uh, uh, arrangement between the central and the local. Now the local government can borrow from the uh, from the uh, debt market, uh, so they can uh, issue the bonds to replace the uh, uh, financial borrowing through those local government uh, local so-called financial uh, uh, platforms. Uh, the, all the things are, are going on, and that's also help to deal with those uh, debt issues. I'm not saying it's not a problem, but the problem is under management and the soft landing is still on the way. Uh, in the short term, uh, we was, uh, expect that the, uh, uh, the growth rate will stabilize around uh, seven, between 7 to 8 percent. The government policy will remain neutral and the growth uh, will remain as a, a so-called uh, normal uh, growth. Uh, here, some argument uh, uh, you know, about the uh, past uh, 
uh, economic growth. A lot of people say China now, uh, uh, you know, start to come into the stage of low or middle high growth uh, period, uh, have, you know, come past 30 years, China enjoyed the, the, uh, the growth of over 10%, uh, but now come to the lower uh, growth, uh, growth period. My argument is that, uh, number one, it's not always the case, China grow about 10%. And secondly, whenever China have the growth rate over 9%, China already have inflation. Whenever have a real number, you know, double digit to 10%, more than, higher than 10% growth, China have both inflation and excess power. So the growth rate above 10% would never be a normal growth. It was overheated growth. It's something policy always want to avoid. And uh, China also has some period of, with the uh, deflation, when China's growth was down and under uh, 7%. That means under 7% is uh, not a normal growth, and if about 9% per, is also not a normal growth, so-called potential growth, because you've got, you got both inflation, either inflation or deflation. So the argument is a, quite a, compatible with the uh, uh, lot of research on China's growth, uh, the potential growth. That was, uh, there are many groups who studied China's potential growth in the past. The, 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 all the, the results of, from those research shows China's potential growth is always between seven to nine percent in the past. 20, 30 years. But now, we, we would like, like to argue that the, uh, uh, the 7 to 8 percent uh, uh, growth rate may still be China's so-called potential growth for the next 5 years, 10 years, uh, maybe lower, uh, around the 7 percent, uh, but it's achievable. It's achievable. So from this point, the, Given that argument, the real question is why we China may still have a, a potential growth at the seven around seven percent for for the next uh, years. Uh, we have recently start, did some uh, so-called pre-study for 13 five years plan. That means uh, uh, 2016 to 2020. Uh, at least that we can show by all the all the kind of the all kind of the approach uh, that China's potential growth for that year will be still around seven percent. Why, and how we can uh, 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 verify for that? Uh, we need to look at the, all the factors for the economic growth. And here we come to the uh, uh, some kind of a theoretical uh, uh, thinking of economic development. When we talk about the growth, we talk about, we talk about the growth of a developing country, we think about the four factors. Labor, the capital, the knowledge, the education, and the institutions. Labor, a lot of people talk about the labor shortage of, of China. It's true that, that in some uh, areas, in some industries, China suffers the so-called so -called shortage of labor, and in recent years, wages have been increased quite fast. But this labor shortage is not because of uh, uh, overall, uh, 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 it's not because of the decrease of population, uh, the growth of population, it's mainly because some difficulties of relocation of labor, particularly because the system provide a lot of difficulties for the migrant workers from the rural area to the, to the, to the industries and the urban, uh, uh, urban sectors uh, to stay in the cities. After, by survey, after eight to nine years, they have to go back to the village because in the cities, there's no public service for them. 
and they cannot join the social security system. So that's why they cannot stay in the city. They withdraw. We call it the earlier withdrawal from the labor supply of the city. So this problem has been recognized, and recently governments start talking about the new urbanization. The new means that we need to address the issue of social mobility. We need to address the issue of public service provision for those migrant workers. If this continues, if this is so-called real, uh, the, the new urbanization really uh, can take place, uh, we will expect the labor supply would, you know, still can be continue, uh, not as, you know, as much as before, but the labor uh, uh, supply will still be there, and the, the wages will not be uh, 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 increased too high to uh, reduce the productivity, uh, reduce the competitiveness uh, of the of the Chinese industry further. Capital. Here's a, uh, I'm not going to all the details. Capital. Uh, China currently still have uh, the saving rate of the 50 percent of the GDP. That means uh, there will be no shortage. There's going to be no shortage of the capital formation for the next uh, uh, years. Uh, actually, it's a still the problem for China uh, because uh, the, 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 this shows that the, the economic structure is, a, is a still problematic and the consumption is still too low and this is a, a household consumption as a GDP. It's a, it's a, compared to all the other countries, it's a still very low. And you can see the gap, you can see the potential, potential growth. Uh, but on the other hand, this is the problem, the structural problem. The, the consumption is still too low, but on the other hand, the capital formation would not be the problem. Innovation and the knowledge, uh, uh, education. Uh, in the past 30 years, everybody knows that Chinese companies are, were not very uh, uh, in, innovative. And they did a lot of the copies, they did a lot of the learning, uh, but not very uh, much uh, uh, innovation. Innovation didn't contribute to the growth very much by all the you know, uh, studies. But this is the natural, because this is development country start at very low basis. And it, you have to, you have to have some time to, uh, uh, to learn, uh, to uh, uh, you know, transmit some kind of knowledge uh, uh, and the technologies, and to buy some technologies. And then you can, buy, and, and it will take time to, uh, to improve yourself and to get into the frontier, get close to the frontier. Now, after 30 years, 35 years, more and more Chinese companies are close to the frontier. So we do expect the next years, uh, next 30 years to come, uh, Chinese companies will be more innovative because they are now more capable. And you, you already see more and more Chinese companies uh, start to have this capacity of innovation. And education, after 30, 35 years of uh, effort of education, China's labor force now has more uh, so-called uh, human capital. So when the labor, uh, 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 the growth of labor force decreased, uh, the human capital now is increasing. So from that point of view, it's also very positive to contribute to the further growth. Institutions. So this is the key question. This is the, what uh, uh, the main, uh, one of the main topics of today, uh, how we can achieve the further institutional reform, which will improve the productivity, improve the efficiency, uh, so that we can have the so-called uh, uh, dividend of the institutional reforms and we will keep, keep uh, 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 growth scope. If institution now is a very important factor for the economic growth and the economic development. And China uh, benefited from the reform in the past and the question now is that if China can benefit uh, from reforms further. There are a lot of the problems, a lot of the uh, uh, deficiency uh, in China's institution, everybody knows that. And the market uh, system is still not uh, sufficiently uh, produced, uh, 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 improve the efficiency of the uh, resource location. So uh, the reform is a big topic. 
and the government realizes the leadership had the so-called party, uh, 18 parties Congress, the third plenary uh, session to produce a comprehensive reform package. Uh, after this one year, more than one year, people still looking for, uh, looking forward to have to to seeing uh, more reform really uh, implemented in the practice in the in the practice, uh, but uh, a lot of the reform is not really happening. Uh, what we can expect the reform to happen, and we would like to uh, talk about that too. That first, then we would like to talk about why a lot of things are didn't happen. Well, first of all, government promised, and a lot of effort are, are you know, under under undergoing uh, that to reduce the government control on the economy and to give the private sector uh, uh, more freedom. Uh, uh, in the market, and uh, let the market play more more roles in the resource rotation. Uh, this is a serious uh, uh, effort. Uh, the current government is really reducing their control and give the private sector more uh, 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 encouragement for their development. Uh, actually, the uh, uh, some government uh, uh, department. Uh, really want to reduce their control uh, for various reasons. For example, anti-corruption. Uh, a lot of uh, officials now realize if you have more power, it's more likely you were trapped uh, in the in the corruption cases. So now they are more willing to give up their power to avoid the risks as a government official. So this is a, this is a kind of the political economy uh, uh, behind this, uh, uh, behind this uh, uh, effort. And I, I think that the government realized the corruption is uh, very much related to the power. And it's a basic theory. I mean, the, the why corruption? Corruption is abuse of public power. Uh, to, for, for the private uh, uh, interest. Uh, when you have too much public power, you have more <coughs> possibility, higher possibility uh, to be corrupted. So this is a sincere effort to reduce the power uh, of the government control because government itself realized that corruption has to be stopped or reduced. Otherwise, the society, the government, the party uh, cannot really go on further. So a lot of talk now also on the so-called reform of the state sector and so-called mixed ownership uh, uh, economy. Uh, uh, that's a, uh, some reform cases already take place, and the people expect more cases to come. And also the government reform, central local government relationships and the independence of the judiciary system. Uh, the fourth plenary session will come up and that session will particularly address the issue of legal reform. Uh, we will see, we will uh, uh, watch what's going to happen, uh, particularly the <coughs> so-called independence of the judiciary system. And the list of the independence between the provincial government and the provincial judiciary uh, system. Also, financial reforms, interest rate, uh, liberalization, uh, actually the, the lending rate already liberalized. Uh, how about uh, the, the deposit rate? And how about uh, the, the further liberalization of the financial uh, flows? And the foreign exchange rate reforms, capital control on the financial uh, uh, and the capital account. Social security reform is underway, particularly how to uh, make the uh, social system uh, universal uh, that people can carry on their uh, benefit. And also the rural land reform is uh, very important. Uh, land reform is uh, very much basic, actually very much basic for the, for the, for the urban reform, uh, particularly the hukou system reform. 
Uh, Shanghai Free Trade Zone is under uh, developing. Uh, the uh, so-called uh, uh, Shanghai Hong Kong stock market uh, uh, direct transfer is also uh, announced, and the people are preparing for, for that. So a lot of the reform planned, and a lot of people are working on the details on those reforms. Uh, but so, so far, it seems uh, not much progress. Well, not uh, uh, as much progress as people expected. Well, here come up to the so-called political economy of the, of the reform. Uh, it's not easy. Uh, you are dealing with uh, all kinds of vast interest groups. Uh, the basic situation is that uh, everybody wants uh, everybody else to be reformed. Think about the government department, you know, all the ministry. And everybody protected themselves from other, uh, from everybody else. Uh, so uh, uh, reform, this, the reforms, institutional change is always uh, a political economy issue. Uh, it's not a pure uh, it, uh, uh, economic calculation. It's not something like, a, you know, switch the button and everybody agrees. No, no uh, consensus. Uh, on, on, the, on most of the issues. Well, there's a consensus that China has to go reform. Everybody agree that. But how to reform, when you come to the details of how to reform, uh, everybody have a, have a different opinions. Everybody, because everybody has different uh, uh, perspective and different interests. So, uh, it's not easy, but the, the plan, this is a, a, a program is for seven years. From 13, uh, to, uh, 2013 to 2020. So there's still some time, and uh, the, the government, the party, is still working on that. So we really hope this can contribute to the lasting, to the long-term economic development in the next stage of China. And it is very important, definitely very important. Uh, but can't, uh, if we think about this, uh, all uh, what 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 I put here, uh, I would say the China story is con will going to continue, and uh, the China's girls will continue for the next uh, ten years, twenty years. Uh, current, currently, uh, China is still in a very low stage of development. For capita income, is still less than seven. Thousand U.S. dollar. The U.S. is uh, fifty thousand U.S. dollars. Less than seventy percent of uh, industrialization. Still, still more than thirty percent of the labor force are in the agricultural. Less than fifty-five percent of the urbanization in terms of population, and uh, uh, the low-income groups count for seventy percent of the uh, uh, total labor force. Uh, Thirty. 35% of them, half of this 70% are farmers, and half of migrant workers earn, uh, uh, all earn very low uh, uh, incomes. And uh, uh, by the international comparison, uh, China's per capita GDP only 13% of US uh, uh, per capita GDP. Uh, Korea reached that level in 1979. After that, Korea still enjoyed 30 years high growth. And you can think about how this time, development is about the convergence. The gap means the potential of the growth. And the uh, past 30 years are actually quite similar to the uh, uh, past 30 years from 1980 to, uh, no, sorry, 1980 to 2010. Sorry, I put this is wrong number. 1980 to thir uh, the 2010, the 30 years in China is like quite similar to the years of the United Kingdom from 1780 to 1850. Well, we're shorter than that, but actually they're quite similar stage of development. So we got a similar problems. Income disparity, pollution, 
social issues, you know, a uh, lot of issues actually, quite a similar. And another year, 19, uh, 1850 was the year around that time was French, second French Revolution and the, 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 the communism, you know, market, Marxism, you know, those kind of things happened. So a lot of the social problems in China, economic and social problems. Uh, but I think that this is a, shows that China is not the kind of the stage of development. But China has a very, quite a different uh, historical background from the you know, Western Europe. Uh, different history, 2,000 years, and uh, with a larger population, very large size of the society. Uh, more difficult to manage, and without uh, uh, the colonies and uh, those, those those kind of things, and under the uh, uh, you know, current structure of the global uh, system, uh, so we're facing very special, different, uh, similar problems with a very different uh, kind of the background and different uh, international setting. So anyway, uh, that shows. China's economic uh, long-term development is not easy. We still have a lot of potential, uh, but a lot of the issues need to be addressed. Maybe a already a little bit too long, but I'll stop here uh, for further okay. questions. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions, uh, but I really ask you to take a question, not a speak. So we will try to be as concise as possible. Uh, Dr. Fine will take your questions directly. Uh, we have until... Uh, 7.30 in the room, and Dr. Fan is willing to try to ask, respond to as many questions as you have. Um, so uh, I'll just let him call on you uh, as he would like. Yeah, I think she is the first one. Hi, how are you? Uh, and would you, excuse me, would you wait for the mic? We've got mics on the side. Uh, we are taping this, and it will be available uh, through our website. Uh, let me just make one uh, advertisement. If you look on the back page of this program, you'll see the website for the center. And we have uh, not only research papers there, but we have a number of videos that show uh, past presentations that have been made at the center. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can pursue that through that website there. Uh, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I'm a reporter from St. Town Daily. My name is Catherine Lee. Um, I have a question about uh, many overseas Chinese people here. They, they, uh, some of them, they have real estate in China. And because of they heard a lot of uh, negative comments about Chinese economy, some of them, they try to sell their uh, real estate. They're thinking about probably move those uh, real estate or uh, invest in U.S. Is, the, is a better way. So do you have any suggestions, or do you have any point of view you can share with our readers? Thank you. Uh, your, your question is uh, a- About the uh, uh, real estates? Uh, Fang Dichan. <音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音><音
So maybe it's time to buy the U.S. property. So from that point of view, I, I, I would say it, it's likely to be the right choices. Uh, but if but a lot of news said, a lot of uh, uh, commentators uh, uh, say that Chinese mar real estate market will be collapsed, will be crisis. That's I, I'm not that good. Uh, actually, since yesterday, <laughs> since the government relaxed of some policies, uh, the, the, the real estate market seems to be stabilized, particularly the national average. Well, you're, if you invest in some remote uh, small cities, which where where the, the population is living, of course, the, 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 in other places the, the, the market will not be very good. Uh, but if you're talking about uh, the average uh, of, of the national market, I don't see now we got the big bubble there. I don't see the possibility of collapse. Uh, so uh, it, it's an, it's your choices to make it. Investments uh, in a different regions, different places in the in, in the world, uh, uh, because it's a it's a comparison. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a relative uh, uh, situation. Uh, but if you say China will suffer, will will have a, a big collapse and the crisis, uh, and that's you have to sell. I, I'm not sure about that. Okay. Thank you for a fantastic presentation. Um, my name is Alan Clayton Green. I'm at the US Asia Law Institute here at NYU. I was really interested to hear a discussion of various types of reforms that you saw possibly coming through the pipeline. Uh, China is famous for trialing reforms at the provincial or local government level. I wondered whether there were any reforms that you saw happening at those levels at the moment in China that you were particularly excited by or interested in uh, and that we should be looking you mean the local government reform and the central local relationships? Uh, yes, so for example, lectures are offering trials, uh, some more experimental reforms in terms of market liberalization. Uh, I wondered whether there were any local government reforms that you thought were particularly interesting at the moment for okay. economic purposes. Okay. Uh, China is a large country anyway. So, uh, and a lot of the local government really contribute to the overall reform by a lot of the innovative activities and uh, experimented. A lot of reforms, including the state-owned enterprise reforms and uh, uh, low, uh, the private sector development uh, uh, programs uh, and the innovation uh, programs and local initiatives. And uh, recently, actually, uh, uh, more people talk about uh, the local initiative, local experiment, uh, rural reforms, particularly the the land reform. This around is actually initiated at local from the local from the provinces with a, a, a permission of the central government. Sometimes the central government asks the local government uh, to experiment in certain. Area, uh, the Chongqing and the Sichuan province was asked for the low, for the for the rural uh, reforms. Uh, so it's important, and I, I do believe in next round of reform, the local government can play very much role. However, uh, at the moment, uh, because the political situation, the anti-corruption, and also the party take in charge more on economic issues. So people are a little bit uh, careful about what they are doing. Sometimes they are doing something, but not really telling people they are doing this. For example, state-owned enterprise reforms, so called the mixed ownership reforms. Uh, some local government are very enthusiastic about that. Uh, uh, some want to sell more state assets to repay the debt. Some really want to see some local state enterprise to be privatized and with a more uh, private uh, 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 initiatives. Uh, but they are not uh, telling people they are doing so. Not, not to make announcements, you know, make the pub publicity about that. Uh, Shanghai, Shenzhen, actually they are doing a lot of things. Uh, so they, they, that, that kind of the initiative will very much uh, be grow in, in the next 
countries. However, now it's time really for the central government to make some decisions because they, their decisions will really uh, uh, make the, the things happening. Uh, otherwise, uh, a lot of things are uh, not really uh, going to happen. For example, the uh, 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 the uh, 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 the social security reforms. You cannot only do on the local levels because now the issue is a national level issue. It's got it's the issue of unification of the whole system. It's not a local issue. You have to make decision on the on the, on the central. So that's why the the whole round of this reform is about. Uh, uh, top down rather than bottom up. So that's why the party, the central government uh, uh, needed to, 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 to uh, uh, make decisions on a lot of things. Yes? Company like a, a true China, it's hard to have a privatization totally uh, overnight. But if you as, as you as allow that to happen for the for the subsidiaries, for example, first, then a lot of lot of other things can fall out. So we 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 have to take a dynamic uh, perspective on that. Yes, uh, you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fong. Um, I was a uh, I was a fellow at Research Institute, and uh, uh, recently the World Bank has issued a urbanization report. One of the core messages is the uh, the density of Chinese large cities uh, have not reached the tipping point, uh, which means that the population concentration is not big enough for economic innovation to happen in big cities of China. And uh, I also 
uh, noticed that recently Premier Li uh, talked about the urbanization locally, and which means the evacuation of a lot of population from large cities. And uh, what will be the comment on these contradiction? And is there political factors? Are there political factors playing between the standing uh, in the standing of the government? Is, is it because that the large cities are hard to manage, and uh, they are facing the governments are facing uh, domestic, you know, uh, resistance? Uh. I personally, I, I, I agree the World Bank assessment. Uh, I, do believe, I do prefer a large city, and I do believe that large city is more efficient. Uh, however, political process never, you know, all the politicians would like to see the localization. You know. uh, the, the Japanese uh, policy always, uh, you know, encourage people to stay away from Tokyo, but eventually all people went to Tokyo. You know, Korea, the same similar things. So, uh, but one of the perspective, one one of the uh, uh, factors in this is that uh, a lot of local government make a lot of effort to make the development of the localities anyway, uh, and the uh, uh, the government very naturally want to avoid the big city congestions, uh, particularly in the early stage of the development. So they want to slow down. At the best, you know, you can think of this way. If you are you are the prime minister, if you are the minister, you want to slow down. You want to, you don't want it to happen too quickly. So this is a, a short-term uh, policy and long-term uh, development. Uh, you know, maybe the contradiction, but uh, it's a kind of relationship, in short run and long run. Was that the thing? No speech. Uh, I want to commend you for giving us a very brief and yet perceptive report. But I would wonder if you would care to address the problem of the very serious distribution inequity problem. It is uh, serious. Actually, uh, my argument is that we are in the stage of the largest, uh, by economic logic, but economic logic, we are in the stage of the largest income disparity. Uh, wages still very low, and there are still surplus labor, and uh, 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 technology plays very much a role. So the high educated people can earn more, but the still. 70% of the population are in the low uh, uh, educated, 70% uh, of the labor force are low educated labor force. Uh, and we are closing to the so-called uh, Lewis turning point. But the Lewis turning point actually is the uh, point where the largest disparity uh, uh, could happen. So now, and until maybe 10, 20 years, I think the disparity is still the, the biggest issue uh, of China. And that makes the China society very, I mean, uh, unstable. Can you see any way out of this? There's no way out, shortly, short in, in, in short time. It's government redistribution is not a way to, do, to address this issue. Long-term development, employment, relocation of the, uh, I mean the labor force, and eventually go through this stage of development. That's the solution. So I don't think that the government have the, ha have the capability to make a distribution for the 70% of population of 1.4 billion population. So it's, it's not possible. So that's why politically, socially, economically, this is a uh, China is it coming into the very uh, 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 difficult stage. And actually, my argument is, uh, I, we don't have the details, time for the details, but uh, uh, I, 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 people are not talking about the middle income trap. 
for me, the middle income trap is the trap of disparity. Because in the middle term, in the, in the middle income stage, your disparity is the largest. And here I remind you, for example, we talk about the UK, we talk, talk about the British. UK have the similar stage of uh, 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 5,000 US dollar per capita income in the history. But UK never be the middle income country. Why? Because there is no other high income country as a comparison to them. Middle income country is a developing country special. And we have this uh, stage of the disparity, and we have the reference of other developed countries, which more equal. So that makes you <laughs> developing country more unstable because people make that comparison, and people always quote how other countries are equal and how unequal we are. And then that makes the society even less you know, stable, more difficult to deal with. So social, social security reform is important. Education for the poor, for, the, for, the, uh, uh, for everyone is so important. And uh, employment is so important. And the continuation of growth, and the continuation of creating more jobs, more higher income jobs, rather than the rural jobs, are so important uh, to go through this stage. No other. Solution. Other solutions, we, we, we cannot go back to, to the, the so-called socialism redistribution process. So uh, we have to go, go, go through. And it's a historical uh, uh, process, anyway. Uh, yes, come here, you. And then. Thank you, Mr. Pan. Uh, my name is Shinichi, and I'm a recent graduate from the Hawaii Department of Politics. So uh, I have a question about the train that, because like many Chinese companies go abroad, bring money, and go to the United States. And they have a lot of actions in like investment, merging, acquisition. Just here in New York, we can see like a couple of years ago, Boston bought the landmark building, which is Manhattan. And just a few days ago, I found the insurance group just like become the new owner of the world of a story hotel. So, and the deal is very huge. So my question is, what do you think about this phenomenon? And what we can interpret behind it? Thank you. Uh, yeah, Chinese money is coming out. We got a lot of money. Disparity, <laughs> this part of disparity. Disparity means the capital makes so much profit and the wages still so low. So this is a, this is a big thing. And we have a saving rate of 50%. So that's a capital. And who saving now? Not, not very much from households. Household, the saving rate was quite a stable. 30% is something in past 20 years. It didn't increase very much by a saving rate, not, not, the, not the amount of what they say. Who made more contribution to this national saving? Corporate savings. Why corporate savings? Profit is high, right? So anyway, we got a lot of money. We got a 50% of saving. And saving is for investment, right? So if you invest all this 50% in the Chinese domestic market, you create a lot of the overcapacity. So you cannot invest too much. Of course, China now invests in domestic market into the infrastructures. The infrastructure is not tomorrow's capacity, production capacity, but is for the future use, like, you know, several way. You can use 100 years, 200 years, okay, that kind of thing. So re re recent years, China making more investment in the infrastructures. But still, it's too much, still too much. So naturally, it will invest outside. Also, before we invest outside, too, but we invest in the U.S. treasure bonds. Not real things, because that's the official uh, capital outflow. The official capital outflow is a domestic term is uh, foreign reserves. We accumulate four billion U.S. dollar uh, foreign reserve. That's too much. So 
the, system, the policy is to encourage more private or corporate use of the thing and to invest in the foreign market and the foreign assets. So that's the trend. Chinese company, Chinese individuals was uh, 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 constrained by the capability of investing outside before. But now more and more Chinese uh, company with the help of uh, foreign companies uh, have a capacity to invest outside. Uh, so we will see more Chinese uh, investment come out of China. Uh, and invest in all kinds of things. Resource, of course, at the beginning there's a resource. And then the, invest, uh, the, 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 the research, uh, the development of the research capability. They, they bought a lot of the research centers. And uh, the, uh, they invest in some brand, some market channels, uh, uh, private, uh, the housing and all those things. Uh, and now they start to buy hotel and all those things. It will happen. And yeah. uh, uh, they will pay some cost because of unfamiliar uh, of the foreign market, but uh, they, will, they, will, they will come. And it's very natural. It's globalization and then you, you invest all kinds of things. You try to be learn, try try to be able to uh, uh, locate your resources in the in the globally. So it, it will be part of the Chinese uh, companies uh, activities anyway. Uh, up here, yeah, you first. Um, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Fan, for being here. Um, my name is Ahmed Zhao. I graduated from uh, Loring Stern. So um, my question is also about the reform. So, uh, because people are talking about, do you see if there's any uh, trade-off between reform and short-term uh, economic growth? If there is, um, do, do you think there's a tolerance level of GDP growth and by central government? And also, do you think the central government and the central bank are always synchronized, or they share a different view in related to reform? Yeah. Well, they, they may always have different views uh, on different issues. But I, I don't think the reform and the short-term growth is uh, uh, contradict to each other. This should be go parallel, yeah, in parallel. Uh, because you, you are addressing the different issues. You know, some short-term policies are necessary to maintain the stability of the growth for the short run to deal with the cyclical uh, issues. But at the same time, you need long-term views. You need a issue, you need reform and a structural change for the long-term stability, long-term growth. So it's not a really a contradiction. Uh, of course, there is a concept, there is a, 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 a effect, there is an impact, you know, uh, uh, each other. For example, anti-corruption, the reform. Uh, may slow down the growth in the short run because the local government now is not very active. Uh, they, 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 <laughs> they, they don't have dinner with the private uh, 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 entrepreneurs. Uh, they don't help the private uh, entrepreneurs very well either uh, because they want to stay away from the private uh, uh, company. So that's kind of the uncertainty may create some problems, but I don't think they will stop any corruption for the for the for the growth. They may adopt some other short-term uh, policies like monetary or fiscal policies to support the, the girls, but I don't think you should just stop the anti-corruption. Uh, that is for long-term uh, long growth, uh, long-term stability and long-term growth. Yes, maybe. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jessica Bissett. I work at the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations here in New York. Um, thank you for your presentation. I noticed you didn't really you didn't touch upon the environment, and I was hoping you could talk about that. Um, I think, as we all know, in the past, kind of the mantra was conquer the environment, develop the economy. Leaders since Mao have kind of been on the same path: develop the economy first, deal with the environment later. Um, clearly, we're kind of reaching the tipping point with that. Um, you mentioned that sustainable economic, healthy economic growth that's between 7 and 9%. I'm wondering if you think that's still attainable if China continues 
A, on the bad path it is with the environment, or on the other hand, do you think those levels of growth are sustainable if China goes on to a more um, environmental friendly path, starts cleaning up the environment, starts putting in place more environmentally friendly practices and holding companies to those practices, do you think China will still be able to maintain that growth rate? Yeah. I, I, I touch upon this issue. Oh, you know, we're talking about uh, the Europe in the, in the 17th century, you have the similar problem of the, of the, of the smog, for example. Right. Uh, but actually, I agree with you, that's a, that's a very big issue uh, now in China. Uh, it could, uh, uh, could be a very negative uh, factor for the, for the girls. But cleaning up is an economic activity. It could be ac economic activities. And they develop their green uh, uh, industries also uh, can contribute to growth. Uh, so uh, I, I do see the possibilities that uh, environment improvement and economic growth can go together. Particularly the uh, renewable energies uh, and the uh, uh, and, uh, some new regulations of the buildings and the uh, uh, environmental protections. Uh, it, 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 it's uh, it, you know, possible to uh, enhance each other. Of course, in the short run, for example, the recently uh, we got a lot, lot of the factories uh, closed down because of the uh, pollution issue. And that's the cost you have to pay. I mean, that, that's something you have to, uh, to uh, transfer your uh, economy. Uh, but I think that's a, a short run uh, effect. Uh, Sometimes uh, the, you close down one factory, the other factories will make, make an investment in the environmental protection, and that's contributed to the, to the GDP growth as well. So th th there is a statistical issue there uh, uh, when, when, you, when you compare to the, to the economic growth, and that's for the jobs. And uh, actually the, uh, the, 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 the uh, new energy uh, renewable energy sector now create quite a lot of jobs. Of course, they are suffering some kind of overcapacity now uh, because of the light of a, a, a government policy encouraging the use of those. In, uh, in uh, if government can ad adopt the policy to encourage to subsidize the uh, the use use of those energy, uh, there could be the jobs. So I'm not saying this is a very straightforward relationships, but I I, I will see the possibility of continuation of the, the growth. Recently, we, we did some study on this uh, uh, so-called green transformation. Uh, for example, if we reduce some investment in the heavy industry and make more investment in the service sectors, you create more jobs, but you make less uh, pollution. So there's the possibilities there uh, if, if the policy are right. It's not easy, but uh, it, it could be done. Yes, you. Thank you, Dr. Tom. Um, the State Council recently banned off-balance sheet borrowing by local governments and also pledged to not bail out local governments if they were to default on their debt. Um, the immediate enforcement of this seems unlikely because the, the economy is reliant on the infrastructure investment that is funded by this borrowing. <coughs> Um, and it also seems analysts think it's unlikely that Beijing would allow a local government to default on its debt because of the ramifications for credit pricing. Um, do you think it's credible for Beijing to say that they won't bail out a local government if it came to that? Um, and also, do you think if it's not credible, will it still be effective in instilling market discipline on local governments? Okay. Uh, it's a credible in the sense that they really wi willing to that to, to, to have that. They want they hope to have that kind of situation. The local government is really responsible. But China's system is a unitary system. So local government is not a have no accountability for the for example bankruptcy. So from that point of view, this is not a very credible uh, in, in, in eventually, you know, if Local government have the debt, and eventually it's a central government issue. 
So that's why now, now the regulation, the rules, newly revised uh, uh, budgetary law, say this. The, the, the local government now can issue the bonds. But how much they can issue the bonds have to be proved by the central government. And then eventually it should be proved by the Congress, by the People's Congress. So the total amount of one year the local government can issue the, the bonds, it, could be, it should be proved by the central. So central control the total, control the quota. So that's the, that's the deal. The long term solution now, in the short term. Yeah, yeah, no, no, long term decision, this is, a, yeah. this is a possible. Yeah. The central government still have the control power on that. Actually, the, uh, uh, the local borrowing was uh, under control before the crisis, mm -hmm. before the uh, 2008 crisis. It's a stimulus policy make that happen. You know, it's allowed. Before, local government not really allowed. Well, the people know local government borrowing through the, that kind of the platforms, but it's not really uh, 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 encouraged. So the, the crisis, the stimulus package, encouraging the local government to, to, to borrow that way. But that makes the situation uh, so bad. You know? So now it's a comeback to the control. I think that, that needed, definitely. This is the main unitary system. You have to have some control of the central government of the local, local uh, debt. Uh, that's still credible. That kind of control is credible. Now the local government accountability is incredible. So that's a that's a that's a situation. So don't 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 think the the, the, the now the system change totally allow the local government issue bonds by them by themselves. It's still the central control system. Yes, uh, you already have the question. So then we go to the others. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Pond. Um, my name is Philip. I recently graduated at NYU. I was just wondering if you could elaborate on what you think are the greatest economic bar uh, barriers to reform in the Hugo system. Oh. The, uh, I mentioned this somewhere, but of course we cannot go into details. The Hugo system is based on the land system. Why the urban government can you know, uh, provided no public service to the migrant workers because they suppose migrant workers have this, some kind of, you know, public provision in the rural area because a lot of the benefits are based on the land because they are still own a small piece of land. They own the land for, the, for their housing. So a lot of the so, so public services are uh, related to the, their land system. So Hukou system is not an independent system. Hukou, urban Hukou system and the rural land system is, a, is a, you know, linked together. So the most important thing now is if the uh, rural people have a very clear ownership of the land and they can carry those ownership, the benefit of those ownership, and to the city, and then they were they were more willing to leave. Number one, and of course at the same time you need the local government to provide the public service to them. So that's a two difficulties. Could this ownership be uh, clearly uh, identified, you know, clearly verified, and can they really carry on the benefit from that? That's, that's one thing. And the second thing is, is the local, uh, uh, urban government can provide some, at least the basic public service, like the education of their, their children, uh, uh, to these migrant workers, to the newcomers, to the, to the, to the, uh, 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 to the city. So it's, a, it's not a, the only issue, the FUCO system itself. Uh, it's a, it's a, you know, the, the system in the both, both sides, the urban and the rural. Uh, somewhere, yes. Hello, Mr. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Jack Yao. I'm from the uh, Economic Master Program. Um, I really want to hear your opinion on the recent Hong Kong's protesting activity of occupying Central. Um, do you think Chinese government is going to recall their decision on assigning 
candidates in the 2017 election, and, uh, or otherwise, what do you think will be the future of the, of the Hong Kong? Um, that, that's out of my expertise, anyway. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't think, uh, but basically, I don't think the Chinese central government will recall that decision. That decision will remain. So that's, that's, that's my knowledge only. Uh, somebody else? Good time. Um, my name is Hang Man from the Economics Department. My question is also related to the uh, recent decision by the State Council to reform the local government debt. And my question is on the political economy side of this decision. So a key element of this decision is that instead of, um, in, um, on one hand, it banned local government, meaning um, the municipalities, city level government to issue debt. It actually um, specified that the provincial government 32 of them can um, issue um, local government debt in the future in a, um, in a, a, a standard market. And the municipality level government can uh, delegate the provincial level governments to raise funding for them. Um, this is a very interesting change of the dynamic in China because we all know that the growth driver in the last decade is more or less um, from the uh, infrastructure um, uh, investment side, in addition to export. And the uh, infrastructure development is really real estate. And uh, on that uh, real estate, the huge um, um, bull market real estate actually has to do with the uh, dynamic between the local government and the central government. We all know that local government in China shares 80% of budget expense, whereas they only um, um, collect uh, half of the um, tax revenue. So this imbalance gives local government the incentive to um, sell land to real estate developers in order to come up with funding for um, inf local infrastructure and for local GDP growth. So this incentive is what behind the um, uh, China's um, the growth driver um, in re um, infrastructure development. Now. Um, banning municipalities from raising further finance to support their uh, local development at the same time allowing provincial governments to be the new mini treasures across the countries. Will this change the game played between the local governments and the central governments? Meaning look, going forward, will um, provincial government become a new um, player in China's economic growth? Because now they will be the ones in the future to allocate whatever funds raised from the uh, public debt market. So, sorry, it's a long question, but yeah, I want to hear your comments on the um, new well, mechanism. You, you know a lot of details about the Chinese government. Uh, but that will not change the situation of, you know, the municipal government still can get revenue from sale of the land. So they can still, before they sell the land, now they still can sell the land. And the, the revenue from land sale is not going to the provincial government budget. So what they want to, they, they want to got is the uh, uh, debt revenue, right? Before, of course, municipal government can uh, borrow money from the local platforms. So only change is this Borrowing through the, uh, those local platforms now is disappeared. And you have to get the uh, revenue from the provincial issuing, uh, the bond provincial government issued. Uh, that will be a little bit centralized, I mean, in terms of uh, uh, provincial uh, uh, management. Uh, but I, I think the, uh, this is uh, something. Uh, uh, this new arrangement is about, meaning that the, the, you cannot, all the cities, you, you know, cannot borrow wildly uh, from the banks. You have to have some management. Central manage the total debt, and the province government, provincial government manage the distribution of local debt. So that's a new arrangement. We will see how the, uh, this will continue, uh, we, the, when this uh, uh, started and how this will work out. But this is uh, basically the management of the government debt. 
Otherwise, it's out of control. Otherwise, without the budgetary law, which passed in 1993, uh, under the Zhu Rongji's initiative, without the budgetary law at that time, China already ran into the financial crisis several times. You know, China could be have 20 crises, you know, all in the big debt. So that law keep China financially stable, keep China's financial stability, but of course create the problem as local borrowing. But this new revision of the law recognize the current situation of local government plays big roles. And you have to have a long-term financing for those long-term infrastructure uh, project. But I think this kind of a safeguard of the of the control, the quota, and the local the provincial control on the provincial distribution of the debt should be there. Of course, there could be problems, great, you know, uh, could be loopholes and problems we will discover later. But it is at this stage, I think that this, this new change of regulation address the current issue of the debt, of the growing uh, government debt. You know, four years, five years ago, government debt only counted for 16% of GDP. Now it's 50% of GDP. It is still under uh, management, but it already shows that the trend could be very dangerous. So at the moment, we'd rather to see that kind of the, uh, uh, control stay, and then we'll see how this uh, municipal uh, government financing would, would, would change. Thank you. Yes. Hi, thank you, Dr. Fan. And my name is Ting, and I'm using the bread from my department of politics. I have a question here. Is we notice that the reform so far has been very ambitious, and the government decided to reduce its role in market. So in long term, in order to maintain the sustainable growth, in order to avoid the investment outflows and overheated investment, how do we or how does the government going to increase the efficiency of the investment domestically? Also, internationally, do you think it is the time to liberalize the capital account in order to attract the foreign direct, uh, foreign direct investment? Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, the efficiency of an investment is always the issue. Uh, but when you have uh, now is about 40% of investment is a government uh, investment in the infrastructures, efficiency hard to be very high because it's a government a public investment. You know. uh, but if the, you know, 60% of the investment is under is now the either corporate investment or investment in the real estate sector, which basically the private uh, 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 company dominant. I would say it, it's it's a it's a market function on this in this regard uh, in terms of a total investment. China is still in a stage of uh, infrastructure building, so that means a lot of. Uh, uh, public in public infrastructure investment. Uh, so far, I would argue that uh, uh, the basic efficiency is still there because a lot of the bottleneck, a lot of the shortage of in, uh, in uh, public in, uh, in infrastructures, uh, because a lot of uh, uh, we have a shortage of uh, railway, we have a shortage of the subway. Uh, those uh, high speed way now is a very crowded already. Uh, the Shanghai, Beijing uh, high speed railway is already profitable in terms of cash flow. So uh, it's already already <laughs> crowded, uh, very hard, even very hard to get the ticket of the high speed uh, train in many places. So basically, you you can say the basic efficiency is there. Uh, in the long run, of course, it's an issue, uh, particularly when the, uh, uh, you build up uh, some high speedways uh, in a very remote area. Uh, if it's not a national security issue, it's a national uh, equity issue, 
the local government could be very inefficient uh, in, in that kind of the project. But anyway, uh, that's a public investment, private investment problem. Uh, capital account liberalization, uh, there's a lot of issues around that. For example, it seems not uh, the issue for China now is o further opening for the foreign direct investment. Foreign direct investments have been China, into China for a long time. Uh, the further uh, invest and there is no difficulties for them, and particularly for make a direct investment, make a portfolio investment is still you know, there are some regulation there. Uh, but for the direct investment, I don't think there is uh, much difficulties. The real difficulty is now for the foreign direct investment is a regulatory issue. You know, it's a, it's a, it's not a capital account issue, not a convertibility issue. It's a, it's an issue of uh, uh, other, other, other things. Uh, for the current further convertibility, uh, uh, for the further liberalization of the capital account, uh, the issue would be uh, uh, things like convertibility. Of capital uh, on, on the capital account, uh, the uh, issue of uh, uh, outflow inflow, issue of uh, 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 you know exchange rate. That uh, seems it's going on, and the government promised to uh, make the progress on this, but I don't think that it's an overnight issue. For example, exchange rate. I don't think China will have a totally free exchange rate and a convertibility overnight. Uh, the exchange rate already have a flexibility of 30% bond. The, the band is now the 30%. Uh, it could be 50% or 60%, but it's still some control is still there. Because otherwise, you will see quite an uh, undesirable situation. For example, recently, why China, uh, oh, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with the situation. Last year, the renminbi got a very uh, a significant uh, evaluate, evaluation. And then, of course, uh, Chinese government will not uh, agree the manipulation acquisition, uh, but you have to interfere somehow to stop the trend of huge capital inflow. Not for the real sector, not for the trade, just the speculation. Speculation on higher Chinese interest rate compared to the US and other interest rate, and the speculation on the expectation of the renminbi further evaluation. So you have to have some interfere to stop that kind of speculation. So from that point of view, China may need a kind of a control for a while. Uh, not very quick and a sudden liberalization on the capital account. You may like to maintain some kind of the capability of interfering, you know, interfering uh, the market. And that, I think, for developing country like China, uh, uh, is, is something uh, practical, pragmatic, and uh, it needed uh, for the stability, for the financial stability. So total liberalization is still very, I mean, still uh, not a short-term issue anyway. Uh, maybe eventually China will go to the total liberalization, but it will take time. Maybe last question? Yeah, last question. So from your vintage point, what do you see as the dominant mindset of the um, local government officials and ministries? Are they competing to reform, or are they uh, doing nothing and wait? In other words, is the signal from the central government clear enough? Uh, they are doing something, but not enough. <laughs> you can say that. They are not doing nothing. But, uh, uh, particularly, I think the local government is doing something. They are waiting in the 
we think central government very, have a very clear signal, a very clear decision, uh, but they are doing something. For example, the uh, corporate reforms. Yeah, yeah. Some okay? okay. So, uh, could we thank Dr. Fung?